Ninja 2, Gunbara Goemon 2, McGinnis the Strange Shogun for the Super Famicom Combat Konami, released in 1993. This is actually a direct sequel to Mystical Ninja, released here in the US not long before, but unlike its predecessor, this one never did. Like, what the fuck, Konami? Anyways, let's dive right the hell in already. Oh, and for those wondering, yes, that's a game genie I'm using. Remember what I did with Herodias last season? There you go. Before I proceed as usual, I'd like to give out my honorable gratitude to Brain Scratch Commentaries, Some Call Me Johnny, Nairman214, Ted Weissen and Solaris Paradox, Zachary Banks the Shmup Master, Mike Maverick, Jim Fontenot, alias Kid Shore Yukin, Gabriel J. Riley Sky 100 to Benton Court, Manta Ray Lava Buster Vasquez, the Boston Open Screen Committee, namely Van Voorhees, Neely Atwood Campbell and others, the Bit Bar staff, Hall Clark, Koltoff, Allen and Kasarjan, Nicholas Harmon, the Super Young Legend, aka the Jap American East Kid from Blown Happy Productions, Rob from I Hate Being Single, Andrew Larry and Amanda Brack, the Dead Collective, Larson Hannah, Tran Brock, DiGiacomo, Del Rose, Martin, the list goes on and on, the Bummer City Historical Society, Ikeda aka the Michael character, Ro, Enos, Brackett, and others, Deborah Fletchner from Watertown, Alana Gordon from Worcester, Eric Erickson from Cambridge, Latani Dargan from Russia, Curtis and Layla from Girlfriend vs, Joe Space Kappa and Christina Walker from The Backlog, Deidre Fisher from Baltimore, Wiley and Jessamy, and finally, how could I possibly forget about Rhythmus Records, Boston 8-Bit, Geek Beat Radio, and especially Glentai. With all these out of our system, and jumping right the hell in... <laughs> For those that recall that other mystical ninja game I covered more than a year ago, or not, what we're looking at here is a direct follow-up to that very same title, which, yet again, was never localized unlike its predecessor. Anyways, taking place following the events of said title in question, we see our main duo, or in this game's case a trio, hence the addition of one of the former boss characters, who will be discussed in a while, one or two of whom we were able to select from the get-go, by the way. Out enjoying some well-deserved R&R at the Ryukyu Beach Resort in Okinawa, after their slew of arduous efforts saving Princess Yuki. while Abyssumaru, aka Dr. Yang, acts the usual retarded jackass by dragging Goemon, aka Kid Ying, into his twisted as balls half nude hula dance-a-thon, with the latter resisting said senseless activity. Getting back to the previously addressed one-shot former boss character, enter Sasuke the Clockwork Robot Ninja. Nope, we're not fucking going there. He pops up near the main pair, informing them of way more out-of-play shit occurring in Nato than ever before. Not only have the mainland and its surrounding floating castle been laid under siege, let alone has Princess Yuki been taken hostage yet again, this time along with the Lord of Edo, and later Omitsu, aka Omichan, Goemon's hometown idol and sort of better half. According to Yai, another supporting character hailing from the previous adventure, no less, a mysterious foreign shogun, an American shogun, I might add, by the name of McGinnis Castella, was behind all this goddamn twisted-ass chaos, and that he and his dopey-ass, anorexic bunny henchmen fully intend to westernize the hell out of their rightful country. In the eyes of our Shadow Tree of Justice, however, they know there's no way in fuck they'll tolerate that shit. Of course, Abyssumar needs to change more than both his attire and attitude, Notwithstanding most of the gameplay elements making their resurgence from the previous outing, there are some notable changes augmented here. Each area they traverse around throughout Edo is in the form of a linking map, akin to the likes of Super Mario Bros. 3 and World, Final Fantasy Mystic Quest, and of course, another Konami creation, Tiny Toons Buster's Hidden Treasure, and none of that two-part malarkey like in its predecessor. As far as the three main protagonists, the series iconic Goemon and Abyssumaru, once again, for the last time, aka Kid Ying and Dr. Yang, respectively, and even the all-new Sasuke have their differentiating speed, agility, and attack attributes that set themselves apart from each other. While Goemon's the most well-rounded of the bunch in all three areas, move over, Leo, and still rocking that same family pipe and slew of deadly long-range coin projectiles, Abyssumaru's slow yet stable speed and jumping are for Donkey Dick, whereas his attacks are first-rate in that each enemy is careened either into the vast background distance, or onto a wall with his paper fan, depending on the setting. In other words, bye-bye flutes and party favors! Not to mention, he still brandishes those same shuriken projectiles, but only travel at medium range before retracting, in the style of the Shadow Blade from Mega Man 3. Concerning Sasuke, on the other hand, in spite of his mind-boggling high speed and jumping capabilities, his attack stratagem leaves a lot to be desired in terms of his dual kunai blades and extending hairpiece, except when the former addressed main weapons turn into an epic flurry of projectiles akin to Revenge of Shinobi and Shinobi 3, likewise with his alternate bomb projectiles. However, just like last time, no matter which character you pick, each projectile decreases a substantial amount of Okane, or cash, so take my advice, use them accordingly. 
With the rudimentary control setup, in addition to the customary D-pad for basic movements, you know, strong and sprinting, crouching, plank crawling, etc., Y and B are for attacking and jumping respectively, the former of which is also feasible for performing power attacks after holding said button down, X and A do fuck all, and L and R are for the traditional weapon swapathons. Depending on a specific stage, you can ride around and or attack in any temporary vehicle for great measure. For example, a mecha duckfish for better aquatic travel and standard firing capabilities, a mech mouse, a sumo bot, the list goes on and on. Upon visiting a town area in between stages, you can actually have your character refill his energy, purchase more items, spend a single night in inns, take a load off of the local bathhouses, oh by the way, whatever you do, avoid the ladies area at all costs. Seek advice on how to proceed from supporting characters, the first including the wise old man, Mono Shiri. Distract and or accost random thieves and pickpockets, provided that you leave any and all normal townsfolk alone, except maybe the lone samurai, random vagabonds, and wildlife. Should you happen to accidentally assault the latter group, the authorities will pop up, complete with a serious case of the red ass, and a burning intent to have you prosecuted. Only the edges sorted ladies are back, you know, extra cash upon contact, including the Omitsu lookalikes, in tandem with the debut of blue kimono clad groupies that will replenish your health for free. As always, they'll instantly deduct your balance if you physically assault them, so don't fucking try it at all. New to this installment is the debut of the Shadow Trio's Goemon Impact Clockwork Mech, whose multiple appearances occur at the end of each stage chain, and in two portions, I might add. The first of which involves the merciless mech trampling and obliterating the hell out of any and all opposing foes, in tandem with the local populace for extra energy, moolah, weapons, and the like. Necessary for each up and coming boss fight, hence the second portion. Since we're on that subject, these confrontations are set up from within its cockpit, face to face with its opposing adversary, akin to Battle Clash, Metal Combat Falcon's Revenge, and especially Super Punch Out. And its only abilities are punching via Y and B, dodging with L or R, depending on your corresponding side, firing off Vulcan shots from its nose via A, and finally deploying a finite supply of bombs via X, the penultimate of which deducts cash, by the way. Bear in mind that each attack impact sustains results in its energy level, aka oil, being depleted. And when it reaches zero, it's fucking game over. Likewise with losing your final life in the platforming segments, thus being left with no other alternative but to restart the entire goddamn scene from the ground up. Impact really does kick all kinds of ass, and has since been a pivotal staple in the franchise, and although it's nowhere near the standards of Voltron, Gundam, Dumbine, Mazinger Z, Megazord, or god forbid Gigantor Megas XLR, my dear god does he come close. Stage itinerary and adversary lineup wise, Goemon, aka KD Ying, and company are seen traversing throughout the Okinawa mainland, both in the daytime and near sunset, leading up to a sumo dojo. Maruto Road, rife with extending wooden log platforms in the style of Castlevania The Adventure. Oni Max Jagoffs, floating lanterns, and a giant Oni creature hell bent on making sure your quest goes to total shit, no pun intended. Hence its frequent wreckage of further structures, a kabuki theater with drums for trampolines, umbrella platforms, fans used as levitation devices, and kabuki mechs with rotating hair strands, which I'm guessing is the reason Proteus 3 takes after it, various fields, forests, islands, etc., each featuring one bizarre out of place, if sometimes astonishing, occurrence after another, running the gamut from an endless soldier through a collapsing coastal landscape during a raging storm, complete with a flying dragon to boot, an arctic setting with collapsing ski lift platforms, and a giant snowball whose mass dramatically increases as you're running away non-stop, later doubling as a water platform while it gradually melts midway, to name several, and be sure to jump right the hell off before it goes away. Hell, there's even hidden underground areas to reveal, whenever applicable. At the end of each stage chain, the traditional two-phase going on impact sequence comes into play, before which a mano -e mano boss encounter also ensues, ranging from a Guinness' signature bunny tooth clad henchman, one of who appears in a Marble Red Sumo mech no less, Cyber Kabuki, a much enhanced, coked up, and mechanized version of the original Kabuki boss from the previous installment, a shadow puppeteer who summons random creatures that have to be annihilated until the candle dies out, at which point his dopey Pinocchio like ass becomes susceptible, a masked ninja with various attacks depending on which form he takes, either as a cat or a fox, and finally that heinous Hulk Hogan wannabe McGinnis himself. Not to mention the Battle Clash inspired first person cockpit encounters with various mech mofos, including a sumo cyborg, slash, a mech armed with a spinning top that also doubles as a vehicle. Who could have guessed? Another reason to hate clowns this time of year. Problem child much? A demented, dastardly old clown mech, ending with a confrontation with, and I'm sure very few have seen this coming, yours truly included, your own motherfucking mech? Uh, following McGinnis, of course. It's no wonder that this series, along with Parodius, another Konami property, is the poster boy for throwing out one out of place gag after another. Either way, I'd be wary of each offensive and offensive strategy in both confrontation modes, because most of these aforestated hostile parties will make goddamn sure your ass doesn't last long enough, thus fucking you 9 million ways till Groundhog Day, and fuck no, this has piss all to do with Bill Murray whatsoever, who, for the record, is currently a bartender at his son's restaurant in Brooklyn, New York. York, but you'll have to pardon my mindless ass rambling. Before I forget, every time you continue following the recent death, your balance gets subtracted by a certain constant amount every goddamn time, so I'll also be wary of that, in conjunction with other tips I have yet to provide, hence my next usual thesis.
While the variable amplified gameplay framework tends to become jarring at times, platforming wise, it's still forthright all around. In fact, forthright doesn't even begin to describe the framework. Likewise, with the previously examined control schematics, more like a gift from God and far from a total pain in the ass to manage. Concerning Mystical Ninja, Gunbara Goemon 2's challenge, in comparison to the previous outing, while it's on the same level, the layer portions can really drive even the most curious import junkies right up the long since fallen Berlin Wall. In other words, I wouldn't even bother expecting this offering to wipe your ass every second. Like, take the platforming and Goemon Impact boss fights, for example. While they're not as mind numbing as the later platforming portions, countless recollections of boss pattern, timing, and attrition gimmicks are of the utmost goddamn importance. In the latter case, whenever any mech adversary approaches you and or fires off a flurry of projectiles, be sure to guard and or fire back at the right time, and only land a strike when it's within your range. Shift into Karakuri World and its Virtual Hell segments, the latter of which will be touched upon in a bit, featuring Cyber Kabuki like I mentioned earlier, and on top of it all, a boss cameo appearance by Count Motherfucking Dracula himself, aside from various other Karakuri World attractions you're able to participate in, like in its predecessor, one of which includes a first stage demo of yet another Konami arcade shmup, ZXX. In order to access it, you have to collect 4 stamps, precisely 4 stamps, from those previously recounted attractions and minigames for total access to said simulator, including Demon Bazooka Ping Pong, a 16-grid puzzle matchup game with character portraits akin to Taito's Puznik, and a Mode 7 race where you have to clean up Left Behind paw prints in the time allotted, to name a few, in tandem with conquering the game's main storyline. Of course, Karakuri World can only be discovered by your own wits alone, as it's a hidden area, no spoiler intended. Oh, and in other words to the wise, amongst other hints to keep in mind, whenever you're in any town, be sure to save your progress as often as possible since this game now incorporates a battery backup save feature, like most Super NES and Super Famicom games of the era, and none of that long, drawn-out, baffling-as-fuck password system horseshit like in the last offering, in tandem with the cash-deducting continuation procedure I threw out earlier. Outdoing its ancestor by five times the combined lengths of Evan Stone and Jonah Falcon's Tallywhackers lined up together, its impressive as hell visuals don't disappoint a solitary fraction at all. In conjunction with the more improved and maxed out sprites of both the main and supporting characters and their opposing regiments of hostile parties, all of which sport as much personality as last time, shit, if a hell of a lot more. The backgrounds, while some might perceive them as pancake flat and humdrum, are much more true to life, eccentric, and radiant than ever before, thanks to the signature Japanese themed exteriors and interiors alike displayed throughout. Must I also mention the inclusion of various Konami Icon cameos, run in the game from Sanchez Jillian Seed, Rocket Knight Adventures Sparkster, the ever so iconic Simon from the Castlevania franchise, and especially Pastel, Winbeat's pilot from the Twinbeat Stinger franchise, who goes out of her way to advertise her next game, Rainbow Bell Adventures, which by the way, was released the year following this game, in both Japan and Europe only I might add. Sure, they don't add anything vital to the plot or the gameplay procedure whatsoever, but they're a kick-ass, eye-candy-worthy bonus for Konami addicts, yours truly included. And as ever, god help me if there isn't much more to convey about the overall look that hasn't already been conveyed countless times. In the music and sound department, orchestrated and arranged by Kazuhiko Uehara, returning from the previous Mystical Ninja, also of Gradius 3, Turtles 4, Turtles in Time, Tournament Fighters, Buster Bust Loose and the like, Tomoya Tomita of Nemesis, Turtles 3 The Manhattan Project, The Infamous Contra Force, and Animaniacs for the Super NES fame, and Nobuyuki Akena of Poppin' Twinbee, Gokujo Parodius, and Jikyo Oshaburi Parodius, alongside the aforementioned Tomita, and even Deadly Arts and Hybrid Heaven fame, the scores are fucking stellar beyond expectation, thanks as a whole to the variety and legitimacy fleshed out depending on which situation you're involved with in, you know, the usual Japanese motif, and are in no shape or form dull or deterring whatsoever. The sound effects are pretty much the same as before, convincing yet vexatious, only serving nothing more than as a provision of blissful whimsy. Opinion set in stone, my top 5 favorites are as follows, the world map and town themes, 2 separate tracks with hints of swing involved, and even the fortress, impact boss, and dragon like themes, 3 separate tracks incorporating an aura of intensity and vehemence, in tandem with their upbeat compositions, with honorable mentions aimed towards the bunny henchmen and McGinnis army anthems. And finally, replay value-wise, ranking another 5 inches higher than its 16-bit foregoer, in addition to what I've articulated thus far, in terms of what really shaped this series aside from the two-player co-op feature, as convenient yet nerve-wracking as it tends to be, and the stage structure and confrontation varieties, to which, and I'm sure most of you saw this coming, I cannot stress enough in reminding everyone to refer back, you'll be miraculously and endlessly thrusting into Mystical Ninja, aka Gunbari Goemon 2, McGinnis the Strange Shogun, time and again, I shit you not. Bottom line, I consider myself irrational to even think about passing this unforgettable romp the fuck up.
Henceforth, what's my final verdict on McGinnis the Strange Shogun? Other than what I addressed when I covered the original Mystical Ninja installment, hopefully what I've been blabbing about the entire time, in terms of every general presentation and departmental quality, should be all the more reason to seek out this overlooked import title. Same story with the later sequels, which, as many would've expected, will be shown in my honorable mentions alter. Also, it's easy, if a trifle baffling, to see why this outing never saw the light of day universally, nor did those earlier address countless follow-ups. Who knows, it might just have something to do with the overall storyline and or the theme, then again for the sake of not looking in too deep, it's probably up to interpretation. Anyways, unnecessary sugarcoating aside, if you enjoyed the first Legend of the Mystical Ninja, you'll feel right at home with Mystical Ninja 2, aka Gunbari going on too. Therefore, by all means, get your ass the hell out there and track this gem down a motherfucking sap. At certain online and retail auctions, a loose or complete in box copy should run you between 15 bucks to as high as 164. Should have a bit more, rhyme not intended. You have my utmost assurance that you will not be disappointed in the least. Until then, this is the Hardcore Retro God merrily signing off.